Eugenics is everywhere behind um, uh, the abortion on demand movement. It is in the Groningen Protocol, which has taken Europe and, and almost passed seamlessly into the secular societies of Europe, which is that if you're born with severe disability, it is better to allow you to die than to have you live a life of pain and discomfort and cost to your neighbor and to your family. That's eugenics. Uh, the idea that we are testing every woman for uh, their children for the Down syndrome gene so that they could be offered the opportunity to abort that pregnancy. That's eugenics. It's, there's just no difference about it. And so people, it's very easy to understand when you say, well, should we be, should we be selecting babies for hair color and, and eye color and strength and, and uh, all the attributes of virility and intelligence? People shudder. Oh, of course not. No. Well, that's what we're doing already at the margins and it will simply advance. Bio, what bioethics is, in a way, that, that term is a new term. Uh, the previous term that covered some of that was medical ethics. There, there are special ethical issues that come up when, you, when, we're, when we're talking about a doctor-patient relationship. But also the term bioethics, I think, arose because of the tremendous advance in technology. And now we, now, scientifically, many, many more things can be done that weren't, weren't thinkable 30, 40 years ago. And so you had these new ethical problems, problems about cloning, embryo destructive research, new ways of painless ways of killing people uh, when, they, when, they, uh, when, when, when they or we have judged that their quality of life doesn't meet the standards so that life is worth living. Uh, I think that's the, that, that term, that phrase right there or that idea right there uh, uh, crystallizes where there is a difference between different, different world views. I think that the pro-life movement is based on the idea that there are certain things that are right and there are other things that are wrong. So objective morality is the root of the pro-life cause. And in this country, uh, from the beginning all the way until, I would say, the 60s, there was a general consensus in America. It didn't matter if you were Christian or Jewish or even an unbeliever that there is an objective morality, there is an external code of right and wrong, and we need to live up to that. We may, not all, we may fail sometimes, but it supplies a standard for us. I think what's happened now in our culture is we see this new morality, and it's the morality ultimately of saying that it's not an external code. A morality comes from within me. If I'm faced with a dilemma or choice, I dig within myself. I look to that inner being inside of me to infallibly guide me as to how I should act. So this is a new morality and it's very powerful among young people. It's a subjective morality ultimately. Um, and so I think we need to be aware of that because sometimes when you just appeal, if you will, to the old morality, it doesn't get through to people. No, not just because they're not listening, but because they have a different moral compass. They in a sense have um, internalized this idea of morality as the voice within. In the law, the abortion decision followed the contraception decision. This whole notion of a right to privacy arose out of a Planned Parenthood attack on a state law which found contraception to be illegal, even for married people, uh, based on a state's rights under our Constitution to determine how to provide public health and safety for their state. Uh, that was challenged by Planned Parenthood, and in that decision, the Supreme Court carved out a whole new right called the right to privacy and based that on several uh, different provisions within the Constitution. And then uh, within uh, approximately five years, the Planned Parenthood forces went forward and said, now wait a minute, this right ought to apply to non-married people as well. That was 1972 that that decision came down. And of course, once that occurs, once uh, you're encouraging uh, extramarital activity, 1973, the very next year, it was essential that abortion be available as the backup to this activity. Now, the Supreme Court didn't acknowledge any of that until the Casey decision in 1992, when the opinion specifically says that, that they were very, there was a lot of thought in the law that Roe would be overturned in 92 in Casey, but instead, the justices just came out in candor and said, we, we understand this is bad constitutional law, it's unprincipled, but so many have come to rely upon abortion as a backup to contraception 
that we need to continue Roe. That, that's exactly in the decision. It, it has nothing to do with constitutional analysis. The genius of Abraham Lincoln was to recognize this in the slavery debate because the slogan of the, um, uh, the Douglas camp was not pro-slavery, but rather pro-choice. Let every state, let every community vote up or down on slavery. Douglas said, I'm not pro-slavery. I just don't want to impose my views on others. Let's, ha let's agree to disagree on the issue. And Lincoln replied and he said, well, look, this all depends on what we are choosing. If we're choosing whether or not to have, you know, pork or beef for dinner, uh, then sure, we'll let each one decide for himself. But if we're choosing to own another human being, then let's remember we're using choice to cancel out somebody else's choice. We don't have the right to do that. So choice does not work without looking at the content of it, what is actually chosen. And by drawing attention to that, I think that the pro-life movement can make pretty good headway. Um, in the development of human personality, in the development of moral personality, choice is central. Now we constrain some people's choices because they harm others. Just because it's a choice doesn't mean it's a right choice. So we in the pro-life movement are not anti-choice. Moral choice is essential. In fact we say you may have a wide range of the right to make immoral choices but not when it comes to destroying the ability of someone else to make choices regarding his life. So you do not have a choice to end the life of a spouse you don't like, or a boss you don't like, or a child who's inconvenient. That's not a moral choice we allow you to have, at least not without some restriction. That's an, an immoral act of your choice, an in unacceptable act of choice. However, when you choose wisely, and it has to be a choice, not forced upon you. When you choose wisely, you fulfill your humanity, you come into contact with reality, you accept your reality and the reality of the world more fully, and you become much more full human person. I think the other danger for the Right to Life movement is to, uh, uh, to, to avoid falling into the conventional legal analysis, even wonderful uh, talented justices such as Justice Scalia have fallen into this mistake, which is uh, that somehow after Roe is overturned that this would become a decision that each state would decide whether or not to protect the unborn. Uh, that is faulty legal thinking, faulty legal analysis. Uh, the approach is that the 14th Amendment was established to ensure that all persons, and uh, as Dr. Wright mentioned in your prior interview, if you're a human being, you are a person, and therefore you are entitled to this protection. There's no other logical distinction that can be made. Any other distinction would be completely arbitrary. So it's not a question of allowing, letting it go back to the states. It's a question of the, recognizing that that language of person in the 14th Amendment in, applies to all human beings. We use the language at many different levels. Okay? If someone is uh, reads the Bible every day and is just soaked in the Bible and that's how he approaches it, fine. Okay, he goes out there and says, look, you know, this is, you know, Scripture says, you know, uh, you know it, it, it says that God formed you when you were in your womb. Okay, fine. I, I mean, I, I'm, okay, there are different pr approaches. That approach is not going to work for everyone. So my approach is that uh, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm approaching it from the standpoint of the intellectuals, the college kids who are going out there, I'm thinking of those college kids going out to some state school or some, you know, any, any kind of school where going away from home and then it gets a professor who challenges them and says, well, you, you, that, that pro-life side is just stupid. Well, it's not stupid. You know, we have science on our side. We have logic on our side. We have the arguments. And I think we need to get our case out there and show that you could really make the case logically from beginning to end uh, just that anyone, whether they, whether, whatever their religion or even if they don't have any religion at all, can see that each and every, each and every human being from, the, from fertilization onward is, is the same kind of being as you or, or I. And what, make, what gives someone a right to life is the kind of being 
he or she is, not the accidental attributes that, that uh, he or she acquires at some time later on and may lose at some time later on. And therefore, each and every human being has a right to life from the moment they come to be until the moment they, they, they die. I think part of it is framing and, and packaging our arguments in a way that, that reach out. So for example, if we're talking to the media, um, you have to find a way to get through to the kinds of things that the media cares about. Um, you have to appeal in a way to the, to the story, to the drama, to the human interest uh, angle. Uh, you have to make an argument that's quickly digestible in the short time spades of, of um, the television or radio. Um, I also think that um, we have to realize that there is, even on our opponent's side, a kind of moral ideal that drives them. Uh, they think that they are doing what's right. It's not that they say we're selfish creatures, we're just doing what's great for us, and we're trampling on morality to get there. They see themselves as, them, as striving also for a moral ideal. And that's why they become very blind and indignant uh, when that's not recognized. So to some degree, I think one way to reach out to others is to, is to acknowledge uh, the moral aspiration on their side and ultimately to try to show why it, they're not achieving that moral goal that they are set for themselves. Uh, ultimately their goal also is to have a, a life that is fully realized, uh, a life that's, that, that does respect uh, values. Um, and uh, so I think that by acknowledging that common humanity, if you will, uh, it's possible to make some headway. We get no traction from talking about death we get traction from celebrating life. And that has to be our, our flag before everything. We celebrate the child and all the difficulties that there is in raising a child. We don't blanch at that. That's what it is to be fully human, not to run away from those difficulties. The best pro-life argument is that we are all human, that each human person is an individual forever and that we owe a duty to respect the individuality of every person. Respect the individuality of the pregnant woman and respect the individuality of the child within her. Respect the individuality of the man who must support them. By respecting all, we can assist all. And that's the argument we should make. It should be an argument that opens the arms of uh, the pro-life movement to include all and not close any out. The pro-life movement should not have a priority. It is a broad spectrum. It should honor life. And there, you know, in every cliche, there's a lot of wisdom. The seamless garment of life is how it has often been referred to. We focus on the unborn, and yet to be born. And we do so because they are the, the, the numbers are so massive. Uh, the, the number of children lost is so huge over the last uh, uh, 35 to 40 years. It's just it's very, very sad and so big. But our commitment to Older people has got to be as, as comprehensive as it is to the unborn. Our commitment to the differently abled has got to be as comprehensive as it is to the unborn. The threat of, um, uh, uh, of taking people uh, out and, and letting them die because they're expensive is real. Uh, the threat to genetic selection is real. So the, the spectrum of life is large and we have to be committed to the idea that every human dignity, as the Declaration of Independence said, Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is owed to every human being, and that doesn't account for uh, priority. So we, we had this idea that, that we would use an, an acronym, basically PAVE. Uh, we're paving the way towards a respect for life. And PAVE essentially means we're going to pray, whatever our denomination, we're going to pray together to preserve life. We're going to act. We're going to get together, we're going to influence the politicians, we're going to influence our neighbors, our parishes, and we're going to vote. We're going to vote on issues. Whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican, or independent, it doesn't make any difference. If you believe in the rights to life that cover the whole spectrum from beginning of life to end, you will go out and make your voice heard as an issue voter. And finally, that we should need to educate ourselves. We need to not only look at the hearts, of people but the minds of people and how we can persuade and influence and educate people to be better informed to counter the culture of death in the public forum and the public square particularly.